read the phase model of our clock and data recovery circuit for the case where there is no forwarded clock and we evaluated uh, key uh, performance specifications like jitter transfer and jitter tolerance. We saw that these are not of course independent of each other, they are complementary. If you reduce the jitter transfer bandwidth, jitter tolerance also gets worse, right? Because if you transfer a lot of jitter to the output, then that means that the relative jitter between input clock and input data and clock will be small. So, jitter tolerance will be better, okay. So, if uh, jtol is like this, where this is some zero frequency, j tran will be something like that, there will be some peaking and then after that <coughs> it will be like that, okay. And this is the unity loop gain frequency or the closed loop bandwidth of data transfer, okay. So, this is fine, we will uh, later see how this can perhaps be improved, but you can see that if you want to tolerate a lot of jitter, you have to widen the bandwidth, which will also Im increase the transfer jitter, it has to, right, because the output clock also has to be moving along with data if you want to tolerate a lot of jitter. Uh, there are other uh, uh, limitations in uh, increasing the bandwidth substantially, we will look at that, some circuit level limitations, but uh, you have to make the bandwidth very wide to have jitter tolerance. By the way, this also is a general characteristic of most, most CDRs, okay. If you look at JTOL curves, they always look like this. At low frequencies, you can uh, uh, tolerate a lot of jitter and then at high frequencies, you cannot. And it makes sense, right, because if it is low frequency, you have time to track it. That is all that is there to it. There is not any mystery here, okay. So, finally, there is a third uh, parameter that is often, uh, I mean, that is uh, specified with this, which is jitter generation, okay. So, let us say the input data has no jitter at all, it is like very clean, okay. The output clock will still have jitter, okay. That is because of imperfections in the components in the loop. So, that is something that we have to look at as well, okay. <coughs> this is known as jitter generation. So, basically this is the output jitter with a clean jitter free jitter free input data okay now this we have to be a little careful but this definition is fine for the case where we use a linear phase detector okay now I think uh, I do not know if you solved part of the assignment. In the bang bang phase detector, the phase detector gain itself depends on jitter, okay, depends on the uh, jitter in the input. So, in that case, we should not uh, say jitter free uh, input data because what you get with zero jitter input data and what you get with some jittery input data are quite different because the phase detector gain itself changes. But at least for linear phase detector, this is fine. We will see how to deal with this for or how to uh, define it more precisely for the bang bang uh, phase detector. <coughs> the gain of the linear phase detector is not influenced substantially by jitter, okay. So, now let me go to our clock and data recovery circuit, the usual stuff. This is our CDR. Now, again, as before, by the way, 
like everything we have evaluated so far right all the transfer functions and so on they are true if you have alternating input data that is 101010 so at every uh, in every symbol there is a transition okay so that's the best case so like i have said uh, if you have random data then approximately if you multiply the phase detector gain by the transition density factor you will get the and use the same formulas you will get the right results okay but sometimes there are some special effects because random data it's not i mean it's by definition random you can have long strings of identical ones or zeros during those intervals when there is no information from the phase detector some other weird stuff can happen but ignoring those special things i mean when you have uh, random data all you have to do is multiply the phase detector gain by uh, density transition density and you'll be okay right uh, the best case for every cdr is to have alternating data obviously because you have phase information in every transition okay and we'll assume the same thing for this right for jitter generation initially assume that this dn is alternating data so it's a, the input itself is periodic okay uh, alternating data with uh, uh, no jitter at all zero jitter okay now i just said that uh, this jitter generation refers to the amount of jitter that is there in the output clock in this condition okay so why why would there be jitter in the output clock if the input data doesn't have any jitter why would there be jitter in the output clock noise where in in the vco then in the resistor okay charge pump currents yeah okay what else what else could it be ha huh? what's that no 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 let's not worry about all those which charge it are you talking about yeah but uh, if there is a delay what happens no i mean <coughs> finally i don't know how much delay you are talking about if you have a lot of delay that's a different thing but uh, if you are talking about small delays here nothing will happen right basically finally the loop will settle when the average current here is zero and that will happen when clock and data are aligned correctly okay so this delay the loss is not it only means that this uh, clock and this clock are not the same that's all okay the think of what else is uh, what is the kind of current that you will get here of course we have i mean everything that you identified is right we have thermal noise in the resistor we have thermal noise in the current sources and we could also have flicker noise as well and then we have uh, phase noise of the vco okay we will deal with all of those things but even besides this could there be jitter ha uh, yeah so actual current here what is the shape of the current here what is it what is the actual shape of icp of course on average it is zero but uh, what is it exactly huh square wave basically it is so for half the period it is up and other half it is down when it is locked correctly right so you will get this now this itself is a, a periodic disturbance now this when you have alternating data it may not do anything but you have this systematic disturbance and this can also cause <laughs> jitter okay now this is not actually such a big thing in case of uh, the linear uh, phase detector but the same phenomenon in case of bang bang phase detector there also the on average that current is zero but it's not instantaneously zero so you will have these pulses because of those pulses you will have some extra jitter okay so that is some sort of systematic jitter but that will be there okay what's that ha uh, yeah um okay but what is the effect of that well i don't know which exact effect you are talking about it could be that of course in fact it will be like that this current here doesn't consist of this ideal rectangular pulses but maybe it is rounded off like that okay the change of shape from an ideal rectangle to slightly rounded off thing that, that doesn't cause any extra jitter okay. 
Is that fine? So, there will be random jitter due to phase noise of the VCO. I will come to what the phase noise of the VCO means. Okay, these current sources will have noise. Okay. <coughs> and finally, there will be some <coughs> systematic jitter due to And this is more significant for <coughs> bang bang phase detector. Okay. <coughs> this is okay. So, again what we will do is we will need to know how much each of these noise is. We already know the noise of the resistor and we can also make a model for the noise of the current source. It is basically the noise of the MOS transistor which implements that current source <coughs> and we also need a model for the phase noise of the VCO that will I will describe briefly now. I mean I would not go into the detailed calculation of the phase noise, but I will tell you what the nature of the phase noise is. As you know MOS transistors have both uh, do you know this? You have both thermal noise and flicker noise, right? Thermal noise is uh, it has wide spectral density, constant over frequency, just like a resistor, and you have flicker noise, which has increasing spectral density as you go to lower frequencies. Now, this what it typically does is uh, it's the same thing. I mean, uh, the phase noise of the VCO, for instance, will increase more sharply when it goes to low frequencies and so on. So, I won't discuss that. I will discuss mostly thermal noise effects here. Okay. So, we need to know the noise of these things as well as the transfer functions from that noise to the output, then we can calculate the total noise. Okay. This is fine. <coughs> so, let us go to the phase model which is phi n. <coughs> So, there is no need to separate this, I could show them together also. Now, this is the uh, phase model and I said we have uh, jitter free input data. So, what does it mean in this case? <coughs> Pi n is 0 that is all right because there is no uh, uh, j, there is no jitter in the input data. Phi n refers to basically any incremental change in the position of the input data compared to the operating point Okay, the ideal case with no jitter. So, when we are evaluating jitter generation, we just set phi n equal to 0. <coughs> okay. Now, we have the we identify the, the noise of the resistor, noise of the, the current sources and the noise of the VCO. How do we model these? How do we add that to this model? So, for instance, the noise of the resistor we can model it as an extra uh, voltage source V n and the spectral density of V n is 4 k d r 
right. Now, how do I add it to this model? Where should I add it? Series with the register. <coughs> so, this is in the form of log diagram and transfer functions. So, what should I do? Huh? No, no, that is okay. I am asking you, we can have either a voltage source in series with the resistor or a current source in parallel with the resistor. But uh, my question is, how do I in include that in this phase model? Before? So, this is the control voltage of the VCO. Where should I add this? To V control. Why? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, it is uh, quite easy to see. First of all, <laughs> one way to see that is this is from a current source, right? This current. So, I have V n here R, okay. And I think in this case, this is like a circuit, right, with nodes. And I think you know that uh, if you have a node with many branches and if you have some voltage here, this is the same as you can move this to both of them, right you can remove this have this there and then move it to both of them you will get exactly the same so okay it's very easy to see that i can move it here and here okay now of course this doesn't matter at all because this is a current source okay it's in series with the current source the current flowing here is not influenced by this voltage so it doesn't matter so it's very easy to see that basically the vco's control voltage is whatever control voltage we had before without noise plus the noise of the resistor that is all. <coughs> Is this okay? So, the noise of the resistor must be added here right. <coughs> Is that okay? What about the noise of the current sources? What will you do? So, basically, uh, first of all, we each of these current sources has a noise, okay, and they can be different from each other, right? It depends on how the current sources are imp implemented. Now, uh, of course, let us assume that the current source, the down current source here is of course, an NMOS transistor in saturation. Okay. So, what will be the noise of this? <coughs> eh? So, basically the model that we use uh, the standard model is 8 third k t g m okay. and in saturation g m is 2 i d by v g s minus v t. So, this can also be written as 16 by 3 k t i d divided by v g s minus v t. The reason I or rather I c p right that is the drain current. The reason I express it in terms of I c p is I c p is the primary parameter here right we are designing the current source for it okay. and similarly the up current source, how would you implement this? We are using a PMOS transistor okay. and <coughs> it can be in either direction, I will just show it like this. This will have by the way I should write G m n, this is the G m of the NMOS transistor and this is V g s minus V t of the NMOS transistor. And here we will have 8 third k t g m p, this is PMOS in saturation and that is the same as 16 third k t i c p divided by v g s or v s g minus v t of the PMOS transistor. Okay. Is this fine? Now, these two noise can be uh, in general different from each other. Okay, There is no reason to suppose that they are the same, I mean the PMOS and NMOS GM could be different. Okay. 
So, what we have is basically a switching between two different noise sources right. First of all you can show that if you have two white noise sources and you switch between them that is you multiplex between them you have this white noise and this white noise you take this for some time you take that other one for some time you will still get a white noise source because the correlation does not change right correlation I mean whiteness that is white uh, the noise being white refers to noise at any instant being uncorrelated with noise at any other instant. If you think about it this way it is very easy to see that if I have two white noise sources and then I multiplex them in some way I take this for some time I take the other one for some time the noise is still uncorrelated from one instant to another right for first of all if for each source it is uncorrelated and between physically different sources it is also uncorrelated. So, you take any two instants the noise will be uncorrelated. So, whatever the result is the noise will be white ok. Now, <coughs> if the spectral density are different from each other in the two halves like for instance in with the linear phase detector essentially you will get the you, you have the upper current source connected for half the time lower connect current source connected for other half the time. If the two spectral densities are different essentially you will get a time varying spectral density ok. This is actually not a stationary process right that is you get uh, some spectral density related to GMP for some time and some other spectral density related to GMN for the other time ok. Now again <coughs> without going into details this can be represented by the average spectral density ok because these changes are so rapid and we are looking for. Uh, changes at much lower frequencies than this right because first of all you have the data period and <coughs> you have ICP connected for half the data period and uh, this other the lower one connected for other half of the data period. So, this is actually very high frequency change ok in fact it is at twice the data rate is not it. So, we do not have to worry about that small change we can simply take the average and move on ok. So, the noise would be like this. This is I am assuming that the with linear phase detector it is operating in a steady state with the clocks aligned correctly then this part this interval is T s by 2 and it alternates between 8 third k t g m n and 8 third k t g m b ok and it turns out that it is equivalent to when you are looking at low frequency noise which is what we look at the average part which is 8 third k t g m n plus g m p divided by 2 ok. Although we have the cyclostationarity stuff, but we are not looking at noise at such high frequencies we will be looking at it at lower frequencies ok. So, that is fine. This is ok when we look at the output phase noise at low frequencies. When I say low frequencies here it is low compared to the alternation frequency the alternation frequency is at the data rate like gigabits per second. We will be looking at uh, these noise within the sort of the around the bandwidth of the loop which is in the megahertz and tens of megahertz and so on. So, this part is ok right. The point is we do not have to go to like very complicated calculation we can simply use a uh, equivalent current source with a constant spectral density which is equal to the average is this ok. So, this means that here I can consider a single noise current source ok this is the average contribution of both ICP and I mean the upper and lower current sources ok and I will call it 8 third k t g m average ok.
Now, how do you model this in the phase model? <coughs> now, what is the meaning of parallel in a block diagram? You have to say where it has to be added, right? So, this is a block diagram, okay. There is no meaning of parallel connection here, you have to say where it is added. Huh? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, basically it is just adding to the current of the charge pump, right. So, so we should have it here, okay. So, here I will call it I n C p meaning it is the noise current of the charge pump, whatever the expression is, okay. By the way, just as an aside, we will not deal with bipolar devices here, but just to give you an idea. So, <coughs> in case of a bipolar transistor, when it is an active region, let us say active region meaning uh, this V c is sufficiently high, then and if it has a current I c, the noise can also be represented by a current source in parallel. What is the spectral density of that? Do you know? In a bipolar transistor, what is the noise spectral density of the collector current? <coughs> so, basically, bipolar transistors have been successfully evicted from the syllabus, right. So, anyway, the formula looks not very different, it is actually the noise mechanism is different, it is short noise, but it is 2 q i c, okay. Now, this may look different from uh, the earlier. Uh, formula, but if you look at it, uh, this is the noise spectral density. This is S i n. Okay. Now, what is the GM of the bipolar transistor in this operating point? You know, I C by V T. V T is the thermal voltage, right? So the GM is I C divided by k t by q. So, you can write this as 2 q i c itself is g m times k t divided by q. Okay. So, this becomes 2 k t g m. Okay. In case of the MOS transistor, we had 8 third k t g m. Okay. Or in fact, I can write this also as instead of writing q i c, I will write 2 k t <coughs> times q by k t times i c, which is the same as 2 k t times i c divided by the thermal voltage. Okay. So, you can see that first of all, this is similar to 8 third k t g m and this is similar to sorry 16 by 3 k t i d by V g s minus V t, okay. meaning you have k t times the current of the current source divided by some voltage. Okay. I just showed this as a point of information, if you come across bipolar transistors you should not get totally lost. So, that is the formula for the spectral density, but given these uh, given these things right. So, first of all which, uh, which transistor do you like better bipolar or MOS transistor, if you had a cho choice which one would you use? I mean not for the sake of answering questions in the exam, I know that you are only familiar with MOS transistors, maybe that is why you like MOS, but to make circuits which one would you like? MOS, why? 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 Huh? No, no, but why, why do you, why do you say that power consumption is lower in a MOS transistor? So. Okay. At every current, it gives you high transmission right? Yeah. <coughs> so, the, the, uh, huh? Huh? Okay. Yeah. So, what is all this about CMOS being low power? It is all nonsense, right? Oh, 
okay yeah, what do you need you don't need anything or okay you can do with the lower voltage i mean mos device offers more flexibility by the way for making digital circuits right there is no static power dissipation if you use cmos logic that is true so for that it consumes lower power but if you want to realize transconductances if you want to make analog circuits to realize a given transconductance bipolar transistor requires a smaller current okay even if you operate the mos transistor in threshold there will be some factor of eta difference between uh, mos transistor and bipolar so bipolar transistors can have lower uh, power dissipation as far as analog circuits are concerned but of course they have other problems you need base current that is a problem you always need this uh, 0.7 volts and also mos transistor can operate in a variety of modes i mean you can make a nearly ideal switch with a mos transistor but a bipolar just doesn't operate like a switch right and the bipolar goes into its uh, what is called the bipolar saturation region which is the equivalent of the triode region of the mos transistor it becomes very slow it is just terrible it's not the same as a mos going into triode mos going into triode becomes a shorted switch right that is bipolar going to triode you should just avoid it at all costs because it takes a long time to recover from there and so on okay but uh, let's say that you want to make a current source you have a bi cmos process and you want to make a current source of a given value okay and you would like it to be as little noisy as possible i mean as uh, you like you would like the current source to have as little noise as possible which one would you choose bipolar or mos transistor bjd why really why huh so first of all in a bjt right you can see from this formula it is just proportional to ic if you want to make a 100 microam current source you will get this noise spectral density there is no flexibility at all you understand it's just 2q ic 2q you can't change obviously and then uh, ic if you want a certain ic you will have certain amount of current where uh, sorry certain amount of noise whereas with the mos transistor you have vgs minus vt so by using a larger vgs minus vt you can get less noise of course you pay the penalty you have to bias it with a large vgs minus vt but it is possible to have lesser noise okay so there are these uh, different trade offs i mean this vt here in the uh, denominator right this uh, thermal voltage this is a fixed number right 25 millivolts so in this in the denominator you have vgs minus vt when it's in saturation region the strong inversion saturation region so that gives you some flexibility that is not there in bipolar okay this is sort of side trivia but i just wanted you to know this okay that is incp now <coughs> what about the vco how do you model the noise of the vco so basically the point is a vco should do this we control the output phase of the vco should be simply the integral of v control multiplied by 2 pi k vco now what does the noise in a vco mean this is the phase noise of the vco okay it gets added to it so it gives you the integral of v control plus some random noise okay now this random noise is this random noise is not white we'll see what the spectral density of that is okay but anyway this is how you model the phase noise of a vco it simply adds to the output phase of the vco okay so there so that's where it appears you have to add it So the spectral densities of INCP and VNR we already know. I mean, it's the noise spectral density of a current source and a resistor. But uh, phi and VCO we don't know. We will uh, uh, consider that. But please calculate the transfer functions from each of these noise sources to the output. Okay, please do that. I mean, we have calculated the other transfer functions, so from there you should be able to quite easily calculate this. So we have the charge from uh, current noise and this noise. and the phase noise of the vco each of these contributes to phi out so please calculate the transfer functions so 
So, first of all we know this uh, phi out by phi in right, does it help you get any of the transfer functions right away? This i n c p right, it is preceded by gain of i c p divided by 2 pi. So, this is the adding it here is the same as adding i n c p divided by whatever gain is preceding it right. Okay. The transfer function from here to the output is phi out by phi in. So, from i c p you just have to scale that a little that is all. Okay. What was phi out by phi n? Is this correct? And phi n instead of phi n, I have i n c p divided by i c p by 2 pi. Okay. So, phi out by i c p is nothing but 2 pi divided by the, this is i n c p sorry which are from noise 2 pi by i c p times 1 plus s c r divided by 1 plus s c r plus s square c divided by i c p times k v c o. This we know is a low pass uh, uh, filter and if you design for a damping factor much more than 1 this looks like a first order low pass filter whose bandwidth equals omega u loop which is I C P times R times K V C O radians per second. Okay. So, this is easy to see it will be a low pass thing. What about this V n R? By the way, when you have uh, transfer functions, it in general it is better to write it like this with some sort of standard normalization. Okay. Typically, we have the d c terms to be 1 and then you have coefficients of s, s square and so on. So, that is one way to do it. Of course, sometimes the denominator may not have a d c term at all. It may have s, then you have to use the right thing. Maybe you factor out the s and then after out of the remaining you have a constant of 1 and so on. And especially when you have something like this where the output and the input are uh, two different quantities. Output is phase input is a current, it is best to also put the scaling factor outside. It is anyway good thing, but in this case this is a uh, better thing because I mean this also gives you the dimensions correctly right, because this is output dimensionless divided by a current. So, the transfer function should also have the same dimension. So, that appears from this one okay. and here this will be 2 pi k v c o divided by s divided by 1 plus the loop gain right, which is i c p by 2 pi r plus 1 by s c 2 pi k v c o by s. Okay. So, what does this come out to? If I write the, I want to write the denominator in the same way 1 plus s c r plus s square c by i c p k v c o. So, what do I have here? What do I have there? What is that? Here 2 pi c i c p here s then Is that correct? That is it or is there something else? That is it? Okay. <coughs> so, I will do it like this. I will write S C R here because in the middle I have S C R and then I will make this I C P times R. Okay. So, this has dimensions of uh, 1 by voltage and the rest of it is dimensionless. Okay. What kind of transfer function is this? This is a band pass. Okay. That uh, 
I mean in fact usually by looking at the feedback where it is a where the different noises are added in the feedback network you can figure out whether it is band pass or low pass or high pass okay. So, in this case it is band pass. So, it is very low at high frequencies very low also at low frequencies okay. Then finally, phi out by phi V C O what is this 1 by 1 plus yeah that is correct. So, what is the answer come out to be if I again write the denominator like this what is in the numerator huh? that is it is it huh? yeah it is basically this term right. What kind of transformation is this? High pass. Okay. What is the value at very high frequencies? One. So these things again, you should be able to recognize by looking at the uh, structure of the feedback loop, right? So if you inject something here, and then you have feedback, right? What happens at low frequencies is that because of negative feedback, whatever you inject here, this whole thing will cancel it off. Okay. You will get zero at low frequencies. In fact, this is uh, this is one of the view ways of viewing feedback. One way is to see how to follow something, right? You want to follow a target. What do you have to do uh, using negative feedback? You sense the output and drive the output to minimize the error. Another view of feedback is uh, to cancel something. It's all the same stuff, right? If you're thinking of let's say noise cancellation, you have to. I mean, now it's very much required because of all this racket that's going on. So you put a microphone there, and then you try to have a loudspeaker so that it cancels it. Or you can easily imagine that when the input is low frequency, you can there is enough time to sense it and then feed it back to cancel it off. Whereas when the input is at high frequencies, the delay may actually be a problem. So, what happens at high frequencies is nothing comes through this side, okay, because the loop gain goes to very small values. So, phi and VCO just goes as phi out. So, high frequency gain is one that you can expect simply by looking at this because the loop gain falls off with frequency, okay. Whereas, from here to there it is the opposite right uh, at high frequencies I mean nothing comes through here and this whole thing gets attenuated it is a low pass transformation ok. Please try to sketch these things we will look at the spectrum of uh, this we know this one and that one ok. We will see how uh, or the we will see their spectra and then evaluate the spectrum of the phase noise ok. 